First, let me reassure you. I imagine some of you might see today's sermon title, Nobody Matters, and worry that your pastor has tumbled down the slippery slope of nihilism and despair. It isn't that at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Today's sermon is intended as a message of broad reassurance and grateful hope. But before going any further, let me introduce you to a character from, of all places, a novel by the best-selling author Stephen King. She's known as Silent Sari, and she figures in the novel Dr. Sleep, which is a sequel to The Shining. Silent Sari isn't a hero, by the way, more of a villainous, soul-sucking vampire, but that is what interests me about her. Just her story, her backstory, which in a way could be nearly anyone's story. Silent Sari's name, her real name, once upon a time, was Sarah Carter. She has a pronounced speech impediment so painfully present, it seems, that she has taken refuge in silence and seldom speaks. One can imagine how the whole thing progressed. First, she was Sarah Carter, as lively and as capable as anyone else, but with a speech impediment, in the way that my eyes aren't perfect, so I need glasses, and someone else might struggle to hear and so need a hearing aid. Sarah Carter simply had a stutter. But somewhere along the way, we may imagine, some kid on the playground, or worse yet, a sibling or an adult she trusted, started to call her stupid Sari, or st st stuttering Sari. And from there, the jump to silent Sari was as predictable as the sunrise. She just clammed. But more than that, one imagines that the hurt ran deep. Silent Sari went from being unheard to being unnoticed, and then all but unnoticeable. Her unique superpower, it turns out, is blending into the background so completely that you'd hardly even know she existed. In King's description, Silent Sari seemed hardly there even when she was. Well, that's enough background. But what I want us to see before moving onward is that Silent Sari first has an affliction, a stutter. And then that affliction becomes a name or a label. And then the label becomes an identity so powerful and so life-defining that Sarah Carter, the person she once was, is eventually nowhere to be seen. She becomes a figment. And as a side note, not being seen, not noticed, not acknowledged as human, one of the worst things that can happen to a person. If a person cries in the forest and nobody hears them, did they make a sound? Do they matter? Now, because I sometimes have a strange mind, Silent Sari is the image that came to me when I thought of the unnamed woman in our scripture passage for this morning. First, she was somebody. Then she had an affliction, a condition of uncontrolled hemorrhages. And the affliction became a label, the woman with the flow of blood. And over 12 long years, the label and the condition became life-defining. How does it become life-defining? Well, here's a text from the 15th chapter of Leviticus, known for its ritual purity laws. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge, 
she, she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. It's archaic and misogynistic, but there it is. So for this woman, that means 12 years of being afflicted. 12 years of being seen as no more than her affliction. 12 years of being called unfit, impure, unclean. And this would restrict her access to the synagogue and restrict her access to conventional society and make her less than, literally, and untouchable. It isn't hard to imagine that like Silent Sari, she becomes little more than a walking shadow, barely a face in the crowd. In fact, in just a moment, we'll see that she is just that, a face in the crowd. But first, I want to go back to the first person we meet in our scripture lesson, Jairus. As our scripture lesson begins, Jesus is teaching by the Sea of Galilee with a great crowd gathered around him. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, Jairus, comes to Jesus and throws himself at Jesus' feet, imploring Jesus to save his daughter who is gravely ill. Now a couple of things to observe. Jesus is surrounded by crowds, but Jairus has no difficulty reaching him. When you're Jairus, a leader of the synagogue, crowds have a way of parting for you. We know Jairus' name because everybody knew Jairus' name. And none of this is to speak ill of Jairus. We have no reason to believe that he is anything other than a good man who loves his daughter and is deeply worried for her. He's certainly humble and deferential in his approach of Jesus, he acts with faith, but Jairus might fairly be seen as an insider, probably wealthy, definitely educated, influential, a man, a leader of the synagogue, far from fading away into a hint of a figment of a glimmer, Jairus stands out. His life matters by definition. He has what we might call privilege. On the surface of things, the only thing he has in common with the woman that we met earlier is a desperate need. Their lives couldn't be more different. Now this is a flight of imagination, but let us say that like Jairus, the woman has come hoping to speak to Jesus, hoping to beg for a healing touch, hoping to be seen by Jesus if she can somehow approach him. But Jairus, because of who he is, is able to just go to the front of the line, receive Jesus' attention, and get Jesus to come away with him to care for his daughter who is in urgent need of care. The woman, nameless and all but invisible, sees Jesus and her hope of healing begin to slip away. The crowd begins to follow Jesus and Jairus, and the woman, grasping at one last fading hope, she's tried everything and spent everything in search of healing. It has reduced her to almost nothing. Says to herself, if I can just touch his clothing just that much, I'll be made well. And amazingly, she does and she is. I don't know how. I don't have any explanation other than that the writer of Mark wants us to understand that this healing is not based upon superstition or upon magic, but upon deep faith and the power of God. Here's where the story gets interesting to me. 
Jesus, who is on an urgent mission of mercy for the leader of the synagogue, pauses to search for a face in the crowd. Who touched my clothes? And his disciples almost laugh. You see the crowd milling about you and pressing in on you from all sides. It could have been anybody. But what we may take away from here is that Jesus understands that the touch is not accidental. Not a bump, not a brush, but a clutch of desperation. He felt it. And he stops. Which is to say he puts Jairus, who is somebody, on hold. And he searches the crowd for the face of need. Because the woman who has been treated as nobody also has a need. This is a clear illustration, if you will, of the last being made first. It's a demonstration of how the kingdom of God works. Conventional structures of power and of influence and of privilege are brought level. And seeing the woman, Jesus does not say, come and see me later. He doesn't say, I'll be back. He does not treat the woman as any less than Jairus. He calls her daughter. Not woman, which might be a generic form of address. Daughter. Sit with that for a minute. Daughter is a term of intimacy, recognition, of family. It says someone who has become used to being discarded has been regarded, seen. It says that someone who has been forced to be an outsider has been welcomed in. You, daughter, are as important to me Jairus thought. We spoke earlier of the pain of being unseen. Silent Sari became unseen because people mocked her stutter. The woman now called daughter became unseen and untouchable because people judged her for her affliction. It puts me in mind of the story of Hagar from Genesis 16. Hagar, servant and then wife of Abraham, soon to be the mother of Ishmael, is cast out by her mistress Sarai as a foreigner, as an uppity servant, as a rival. She's cast into the wilderness to live or die. It makes no difference. Talk about being reduced to nothing. Talk about being unseen. But recalling the story, the angel of the Lord comes to Hagar and calls her by her name. And in Genesis 16, 13, the text says, she named the Lord who spoke to her. You are El Roy. You are the God who sees. Ever and always, God sees the unseen, sees the outcast, sees the outsider. Ever and always with God, the ones the world calls nobody matter. Not only does nobody matter, nobody matters first. As our story from Mark concludes, it seems that Jesus paused with the woman he has named daughter has had disastrous consequences for Jairus. Even as Jesus finishes speaking with her, some people come from Jairus' house to report that his daughter has died. Jesus tells Jairus, do not fear, only believe. 
is regarding the woman in her need does not mean that he has disregarded Jairus or his daughter. Jesus continues on. His mission of mercy is completed. The daughter of the leader of the synagogue is also miraculously healed and restored. And all are amazed. But my takeaway from this text, at least for this day, is that on the way to heal the daughter of a dignitary, Jesus stopped to see someone who had not been seen and called her daughter and made her whole. Silent Sari got disappeared, a shadow in the corner. The woman in our scripture lesson got disappeared, the face in the crowd. Hagar got disappeared, an outcast in the wilderness. Every day, for reasons of race, or gender, or sexual orientation, or mental illness, or physical handicap, or immigration status, or criminal record, or a hundred other reasons, people get disregarded cast out and shut out and disappeared. They aren't counted. They aren't seen. Sometimes, may God forgive us, they get disappeared by us. But we worship a Savior, Jesus, who stops to call them son or daughter, and a God, Elroy, who sees them. Perhaps that will help us at last to see as well. In the kingdom of God, the kingdom that we yearn for and pray for, every nobody, every nobody, every nobody is somebody. And each nobody matters. Do you ever feel unseen? Hear this word from the Gospel of Luke. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Even the hairs on your head are counted. Do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. You are precious, and you are seen. May God heal the eyes of any who say otherwise. Amen.